Well, hello and welcome. Andrew Peterson is my name and I'm the CEO of the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia and welcome to day nine of G'day Glasgow, the program that brings you the updated information, insights and a little bit of entertainment where possible around what's happening on the other side of the world at what is now the largest climate change conference in history. So no deals have been made yet on the three main goals of the UN, but by the same token, no one has stormed out yet. Former US President Obama gets rock star treatment as he's criticised China and uh, Russia for not attending the COP. And Boris Johnson may have to bike it back to Glasgow just to save the conference. Let me begin by acknowledging that this is being broadcast to you from the land of the Camaragal people and we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and particularly welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who have joined us today. Well, let's be clear, no deals have been made so far on what has now concluded as day eight of the COP um, on the three main goals of the UN conference. The first obviously being pledges to cut emissions in half by 2030 to keep Paris climate deal of 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise uh, alive as a goal. Secondly, the need for $100 billion annually in financial help from rich countries to poor ones. And third, the idea that half of that money, of that money needs to go to uh, adapting to global warming's worst effects. So the COP talks are getting messier. But here's what we know so far. The official stock take of COP26 and the Paris Agreement negotiations only this morning now reveals a raft of outstanding issues to work through this week before consensus can actually be reached. Um, but as one finance co-facilitator uh, recently or reported overnight, um, he said to have likened the negotiations and the process to how whiskey needs to have good ingredients, heat, and patience, these three elements that will be necessary as delegates try to distill the long list of texts that is still before them as they um, combine these key ingredients for the coming week. Here's what we know. A Bloomberg article um, reported only in the last few hours that talks at the COP on international carbon, uh, mar try again, carbon markets are running into some difficulty as the UN now apparently lines up behind the uh, European Union with objections to a key demand from developing countries. Uh, next, as we reported in yesterday's program, one idea that is starting to gain even more traction, namely that making countries review and if necessary, update their emissions cutting pledges every year, rather than on the current five year schedule. If this was to actually eventuate, then Australia could actually be pressured to improve its 2030 emissions reduction target as soon as next year, according to a summary of negotiating points that were released by the COP presidency. Next, a greenwashing watchdog is going to be set up by the United Nations to name and shame companies that fail to deliver on net zero commitments. So be very careful when you sign up to that race to net zero, very important. This panel that will be set up is going to draw up the rules for judging the environmental credentials of what are called non-state actors. Meanwhile, the Washington Post has reported that an investigation that they have undertaken shows that many countries are in fact under-reporting their greenhouse gas emissions in their own reports to the UN. So this probably is the reason why we're talking about a little more veracity and credibility in the reports that are being provided. The Times is also reporting that Boris Johnson is considering returning to Glasgow this week to try to rescue the UN climate conference amid growing concern that it will fail to do enough to prevent dangerous global warming. Have a look at the picture in bottom left. As exemplified by this picture of Tuvalu Foreign Minister Sir Simon Coffey, as he addresses cameras while knee deep in the ocean, to highlight the sea level rises affecting his country, it draws plenty of attention and, uh, and admiration on social media as it is an issue affecting 
so many people in so many countries that are least able to accelerate ambition and, um, and action to address it. And the big topic of last uh, of yesterday, the eighth, was adaptation. It has long been a bone of contention for the UN summits amid concerns that finance is overwhelmingly focused only on mitigation of climate change rather than on adapting societies and their economies to changes in the risks that are becoming increasingly apparent. So it came as somewhat of a surprise that $232 million in what arguably amounts to a drop in a tempestuous ocean was committed to the Adaptation Fund, which is a fund created in 2001 under the Kyoto Protocol and helps developing countries build resilience and adaptation to climate change. Now, why it's, it's the single uh, highest mobilisation to the fund of recent times and is more than double the, high, uh, the previous highest collective mobilisation, it has to be said, it does look as though it's a little on the small side. Uh, as a sidebar, the UK government committed 290 million pounds in a new funding for climate, climate adaptation worldwide. Meanwhile, Barack Obama was the star at COP26 on the 8th as he urged youth that were concerned about the climate crisis to quote, don't sulk, get busy. Meanwhile, the Science-Based Targets Initiative announced six private equity firms have had emissions targets approved by the group for the very first time. This announcement came as the SBTI launched some new guidance for how private equity firms can actually set out credible net zero targets. A very major NGO, Global Witness, has actually counted up the number of fossil, uh, fossil fuel lobbyists that are at the Glasgow conference. They came up with a number of 500, meaning if it were a, an official delegation to the COP, it would actually be the largest. Brazil, has 479 representatives at the conference, and it's got the biggest state, state actor or government or party uh, representation there. Australia, last count, had 94. And finally, the Holy Grail has been released. Yes, the Glasgow cover decision. Um, interestingly, Greenpeace called it out. Um, with a very strongly worded warning that the Saudi government apparently is working to cripple the climate, climate talks, noting that the country's negotiators moved last Friday to block negotiations about this particular document um, coming out in its draft text. And already there have been complaints that the list um, is of too many items, too many ingredients, and we're not going to see uh, this particular document land any time soon. So now you're up to date. Let's now welcome our speakers. They will be shocked by the headpiece that I have. As I threatened our audience only quite recently, I was going to start wearing some of my um, cop memorabilia, and this just happens to be the cap that we got um, at the Katowice conference in um, 2018 at COP24. Yeah, I'll take it off. It's pretty bad. All right. So we big welcome once again to Dave Rouse from Carbon Click, and in particular, thank you, Rachel Allen Barkas, for that comment. Uh, we welcome um, my counterpart uh, from Germany, which is Anna Lee Haxelberger. Big welcome, Anna, to you. Thank you. Hello on the other Good side morning. of the world. And hello, Dave. So as is our way, we always uh, give the very first question to the COP novice. And in this particular case, it goes to Anna. So that question, Anna, is have you found the good coffee yet? Yeah, good question. Um, I actually, I told you before, the German pavilion used to have a coffee bar, but this year, unfortunately, it does not. So it's only a virtual coffee bar. So there's no coffee in the German uh, pavilion. So I will definitely be checking out the Australian coffee, which you pointed out to me is the best coffee uh, at COP. So I will definitely be sure to go there today. Well, I can't uh, take I've credit for that. Let's go. It, you, it is you, the best. I have scoured everywhere. <laughs> It's, it's Dave who told us, I think, last week and verified by Matthew Warncombe from AgriProof. So, you know, and you, you, you find the joy in a cop where you can. And if it's coffee and it keeps you going, then that's where you go for it. So um, uh, let's start firstly with a serious question, 
which was um, firstly to you, Anna, what have you observed about your country's representation? I appreciate you've only just recently arrived, but coming into the COP and particularly what you think are the um, negotiation points of your country, what do you think about their preparation and now representation at this COP? What's your feel about what their, what their role is going to be in this particular conference? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, so for once, I just said it, we do have a German pavilion, which is taking place hybrid this year. So um, I think most of the pavilions are actually taking uh, in a hybrid format. Um, and then in, in Germany, we have this special setup that our negotiation team is also part of the EU negotiation team. Um, and we also have a special setup. You might know we, we just had elections in uh, September and might be having a new government um, by the end of this year. Mm. So I think uh, Chancellor Merkel was here during the World Leaders Summit. Um, but um, since we have new EU targets and new German targets, she just uh, sort of re-announced those and there was nothing um, new she, she could announce. I think one of the um, points that um, are important for Germany or where Germany has also taken the lead is climate finance. So our state secretary Flassbad was one of the two um, who was um, charged um, or was in charge of uh, developing um, the uh, 100 billion, um, I'm not going to say contract, but just mobilizing the finance. Um, and they, as you know, didn't succeed in mobilizing it mm. for 2020 or even 2021, but at least 2023, I believe. Um, oh, so I no, Matt, it might be now 2022, according to um, John Kerry. So, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> very well, very interesting. So, um, Dave. You, you and I belong on the other side of the world, um, but uh, New Zealand's response to climate has been somewhat different, but uh, most importantly, they're going through a, a rather deep and insightful review of their current direction. What's your observation about New Zealanders, uh, the New Zealand government, more accurately, on the ground at this COP? Are you talking to them? What are you hearing from them? How are they playing a role? They seem to be very involved particularly with the UK COP presidency in the last few days in helping the presidency get all of these issues over the line that need to be achieved. What are you seeing? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So we've got quite a small delegation here this year, um, but the, I think the general consensus around COP is that there's a lot of disappointment in the presidency this year when you compare it to previous COPs with the level of organisation behind Paris. Um, it's been it's been clear that there's been a, a lack of organisation and now everybody is scrambling to play a catch up. I think the New Zealand government is saying, look, uh, we're not that uh, big on the world scale, um, but the influence maybe that we can have is by helping the UK presidency to lift its game. Um, and and backtrack on some of the things that should have already been done um, retrospectively to, to assist. Um, but of course, where we are, we're punching hard um, for climate change. Um, we are probably, as a, as a government, uh, realizing that we've made a lack of, um, a, a lack of inspirational commitments, particularly around the methane issue, mm. um, where the rest of the world is looking at us as uh, supposed green leaders and saying, well, you know, <laughs> the green leaders can't step up and give us something inspirational, okay. what hope have the rest of us got? So, so there's a lot of pressure on New Zealand to now lift its game over the final week of COP26. Oh, okay. Interesting. We're not getting that sense in Australia. We're not expecting Australia to lift its game at all. Oh, dear. Well, after you lose the footy on the weekend, what do you expect? Um, all right. So let's then turn to the question of business. And it's an interesting segue, Andrew, commenting about Australia, because um, our audience, which is largely Australian, probably knows quite a lot about what business in the civil society have been doing and calling for in Australia around net zero, but help us understand what business has been doing in your respective countries to drive that net zero ambition. Let's start with um, Dave first. 
Yeah, so so New Zealand's been, I guess, one of the leaders in the world from a business-driven perspective. Um, we don't, as a as a nation, we don't hold a lot of hope in our government, so we tend to take the rule book into our own, uh, or take our own destiny into our own hands a little bit. Um, so there's been a large consumer-driven movement for a number of years now um, that businesses who are adjusting to, business who, businesses who are responding to, are doing really, really well over here. Um, and and that's the leadership that we need to continue. You know, this is not a government uh, government only job to solve climate change. It's you, it's me, it's it's the businesses mm. uh, that we work in, the businesses that we purchase from. Um, and there's there's been a transition over here from accounting and uh, marketing for net zero versus what is real, what is actually going to make a tangible difference. And this comes down to things like what are the quality of carbon offsets that we're using to achieve and claim net zero and how additional really are they? Um, I, I see a lot of catch up going on in Australia over the last couple of years, particularly since all of those, uh, all of the wildfire seasons have started escalating. Um, there's been a lot of realization and um, I, I see the same thing going on in Australia, a very rapid catch up being played. Uh, by the business community there as well through through our business clients in Australia. Mm, okay, interesting comparison. Well, and similarity actually. So um, Anna, Germany, industrial powerhouse, pivoting rather quickly to EVs apart from anything else. What else is business doing in Germany to respond to the net zero ambition? Yeah, so I can only speak to the 40 member companies that we have in our network. And um, for us, um, I think that um, the SBTI in the German market and the European market has had immense uh, traction and popularity. I don't know about Australia, but um, here in, in Germany for our network, I can say that um, more than two thirds of our companies now have science based targets or are in the course of uh, setting them. Um, and now also you, you mentioned the net zero standard um, having been launched, I think two weeks ago, um, that's gonna be like the, the next step in terms of setting ambitious targets because it uh, requires, as you know, like 90 to 95% uh, reduction depending on the sector. So I think that would be uh, a challenge also for, for the Econsense um, member companies. Um, but obviously that's just setting targets and that's not where uh, ambition ends. So if, if we speak about uh, implementation, I think um, on the technological side, um, it's obviously very uh, sector specific, but as you said, um, electrification where possible is a, a route that I think almost all companies are going down, especially the automotive uh, companies in our network that have um, mostly committed to EVs only. Uh, and then uh, green hydrogen, um, especially for the heavy industry, um, so steel, chemical, I think we do actually have uh, some partnerships set up with Australia, um, at least the Federation of German uh, Industry has some partnerships yep. there. On hydrogen. <clears throat> yeah, yes. then obviously for heavy emitters also carbon capture, direct air capture. Um, um, are measures once everything else is exhausted and um, that are being resorted to. Um, but we also discuss like the governance mechanisms in our co member companies because they are common um, irrespective of the technological uh, challenges. So what we see a lot is that um, companies now apply um, things like internal carbon pricing. So setting a, um, a KPI a shadow price um, for steering investment decisions and um, also linking their executive pay to their science-based targets or to their net zero ambitions. So those are governance uh, mechanisms that we see. Um, so I think, yeah, the German companies that I can speak for uh, have fully understood sort of what it takes um, to transition, but we're still um, in a phase where they have a good hold of their scope one and two emissions and have their target set. So I now, now think that the focus will move to um, supply chain action. Um, so I think that's, that's the road ahead, at least for climate. Yeah. Mm. Let, just to pick up on a few thoughts from what you were saying, um, you're speaking on a panel tomorrow with um, German CEOs or senior business leaders, um, and it's a question to both of you, but we'll start with Anna first. Why do you think they've gone to COP? Um, COP, COP was always, as I said in the opening, um, 
a conference that um, particularly had a heavy presence of fossil fuel rep business representation. But just observing um, a lot of um, uh, commentary over the last couple of weeks, I get the sense that there's so many more different industry sectors that have gone to COP this year, uh, potentially for the first time. Why do you think they've gone to this one? What is it about this one that tells them that this, this is something very important that they have to be alive to? Uh, sorry, Anna first. <laughs> yeah, I can go first. Um, so the as I said, I just arrived yesterday, but I had the chance to speak to some of our um, business members yesterday. And I think for them, um, it's mostly a chance to connect to policymakers, to connect to NGOs. Um, and I think many companies are now at a point of maturity where they cannot uh, really go further um, by just looking at their own company. So what we see a lot now are these new alliances, not only at COP where we see um, all of the uh, new initiatives and uh, pledges that Dave has just mentioned around halting deforestation, uh, about um, methane, um, but that's what we also see in the corporate world. So we now have public-private partnerships being set up. For example, the Leaf Coalition is one that some of our uh, member companies are a part of. Um, oh, so I think okay. that is something that um, yeah, has gained traction for, for German companies to um, not only speak to business representatives, but to really have a broader perspective, not only internationally, but speaking to different um, actors, uh, policymakers, NGOs, scientists. Um, so these new alliances is something that I hear a lot uh, here in Glasgow. Yeah, and they're getting quite a deal of traction and profile in the media during the course of the last few days. If, uh, Dave, if we turn to New Zealand, um, talking to your friend, uh, Mike Burrell, at uh, the Sustainable Business Council in New Zealand, one of the things that struck me about the delegation that was going from New Zealand was how you all came from different sectors, uh, whereas Australians were ostensibly energy uh, and finance, uh, so playing to our strengths, one suspects, but uh, quite a diverse um, cohort of business leaders going from New Zealand to the COP. What were they most interested in? Or what have yeah, you so, been most interested in? Well, business leaders in New Zealand are most interested in, um, in the role that they can play in actually being part of the solution here. So um, we've got a wide, wide range of industry um, our energy sector is already relatively uh, mature in the uh, sustainable space. Uh, we're about 85% renewable. So I guess uh, Australia has that massive renewable transition opportunity ahead of it, um, which is why you see such heavy representation in that space. Um, that for me, um, the, the big thing is we're already seeing um, a huge demand in this space um, by consumer-led consumer um, that businesses are responding to. And businesses are looking to our leaders and saying, well, they've failed us in the last few COPs. And we actually, since the last IPCC report came out in particular, there's been a flurry of business leaders putting their hand up and saying, hey, we're gonna have to help pitch in and solve this because we, we actually don't have much faith in our leaders to do this for us. And there's too much at stake not to get in, uh, get involved, see what's actually going on on the ground and see where we can actually build these networks. Um, I was having dinner with the um, sustainability manager uh, two nights ago for the world's largest steel producer in Russia. And it struck me that their footprint is more than double New Zealand's entire, um, right. <laughs> entire carbon footprint. Right. So when you have leaders of some of the largest businesses, you realize actually they can, they can have as much influence on where uh, climate change goes as the governments can. So it's, it's really important for them to actually get in and get involved and for governments to listen to them and support them on this uh, transition as well. Yeah. It, it's interesting you raise that about the role of business because I was reading today um, some commentary that the, the, the state actors, the countries, the parties, have suddenly come to the stark realisation that the Paris Agreement requires them to do something. So it's a bottom-up approach rather than the top-down, which is Kyoto. And that's kind of shocked 
countries to say, yeah, yeah, you're supposed to do something and we'll call it out, but we're not, we're, you know, the apparatus is such that we can't do anything to penalise you, but by the same token, it doesn't prevent us from going and talking to other parties about being involved in the process of getting the Paris Agreement realised. And you have both pointed to the interesting role that business is going to play. Uh, my question is, do you think thus far they see that they have a role to play when there is no recognition for their role as such um, under the Paris Agreement? Yeah, I, I, I believe particularly when you look at the voluntary carbon markets um, and, and the effect that these negotiations currently are having um, in Article 6, Section 4, um, I, I think there is a clear role uh, evolving um, and this is, this is maybe the, the first COP where that opportunity is emerging strongly, um, but unfortunately it's probably the last COP that the opportunity actually exists for us to meaningfully um, listen and, and work together with business. So it's going to be a very, very busy week when it comes to um, where governments can um, start to factor, factor this in uh, with their planning, particularly in Article 6. Yeah, kind of case of get on board or get out of the way. Um, Anna, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I think what has become clear is obviously the role that um, business is playing in, in combating climate change, and, and that's also being increasingly recognized. And also, I think for our companies, uh, the Race to Zero campaign that many have joined, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, those are already mechanisms for companies to showcase their ambition on a way to a net zero economy. So I think you were pointing also um, to those corporate determined contributions um, that the World Business Council has um, mm. um, proposed. I'm not sure what, what our companies actually uh, think of that, but I think we do already have some mechanisms to, to showcase their ambition. Um, so um, I, I'd say that they do feel recognised uh, in a way also being part of this COP here, yeah. Yeah, well, let, let's, let's go to the last question and that, that goes to the issue of what do, you, what do you think business wants from this COP? Let's start with you, Anna. Mm, I think um, for our member companies, um, mainly... Um, I mean, many focus on the finalization of Article 6. Um, mm. And I mean, you hear mixed signals, but um, also a little bit of optimism. So and that's at least uh, what I heard. Um, and then um, I think what is new at this COP and what many um, of our member companies um, find interesting is that nature for the first time is at mm. the center of this COP. So really the interconnection between climate and biodiversity um, and also discussing that critically because not all nature-based solutions are actually positive for the climate. So um, I think this will hope or I hope that this will serve as some kind of inspiration and guide for companies to, to look at climate, um, biodiversity, circular economy, to look at all of those topics um, um, yeah, jointly uh, and address them jointly. Mm. And Dave, what's your um, what's your thoughts? Yeah, from my business? perspective, but businesses want clarity around the rules uh, first and foremost. So, um, looking at the the greenwashing watchdog, it will be really important um, for for non state actors. Um, and looking at what what can um, businesses do to actually make a tangible difference. How do we bring integrity into those carbon markets, um, particularly of interest to business, is the um, mechanisms for removals um, and, and the issue of double counting around that, which is mm. highly controversial right now. Mm. Um, but whichever way it goes, they, they just want some clarity. Um, ideally, they want the um, removals mechanism to be in place so that um, they know every dollar that they put towards um, environmental outcomes is something that is uh, additional to what a government will do. But a lot of businesses also have no hope in the government. So they, they feel that um, even if it is, uh, if there is no removal mechanism, governments aren't going to meet these targets anyway. So 
Um, so that that can be a little bit divided, but but certainly that clarity so that they can all start moving in whatever direction that might be is um, is probably the biggest thing that I see here mm. from um, business perspective. But also raising the bar, raising the profile and the minimum standards on what makes a qualifying carbon offset um, is, is really important to businesses as well. We're seeing IETA, uh, WWF and other organisations banding together to try and um, build that minimum standard yeah. uh, higher. And, yep. and we're seeing governments on the on the um, compliance market, um, of course, arguing with Brazil, China, South Korea and India around the double counting um, and, and integrity around some of those older credits as well. So it lots to unpack this week. It is ever thus. It is ever thus. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Thank, thank you for your insights. It's sad that we couldn't have Joanne with the, um, the South African perspective because there was some interesting tidbits over the last 24 and 36 hours from that country, but hopefully we can bring her in later in the week. But it's getting awfully jam-packed, can I tell you? Very exciting. So thank you for that. I just wanted to jump back into the um, slides and promise to give you an update on the uh, Good Cop Outcome Barometer and have added a few items which you will see in white. So, for example, common timeframes from nationally determined uh, NDCs is looking like a real possibility. Surprisingly, Netherlands, which hadn't signed up to the, green, uh, the Global Coal uh, Clean Power Transition Statement, has now done so. But South Korea has actually clarified that it never agreed on a phase-out date of 2050, and in fact, uh, on 2040 rather, and in fact, maintained that it is in fact still at 2050. Meanwhile, the global, the global goal on adaptation is now on the agenda for the first time, but will it be uh, determined and finalised at this COP is an open question. And we were talking around this um, issue of ambition, that a covering decision, which is now under consideration, and you've seen the first draft, uh, with sections proposed on topics that are voluminous, so it will get whittled down. That You just saw the contents page, so stay tuned. And the last is loss and damage, which I, I, I perhaps steered you incorrectly last, no, uh, last night uh, because there has actually been some work done um, which was concluded late on Saturday night, but there's still a large number of decisions that have to be made, including who's actually going to be responsible for the body that is going to administer it. So it could well not happen, which is disappointing. Don't forget that today, Tuesday the 9th, which has just started in beautiful downtown Glasgow, is Gender Science and Industry Day. And already there have been a number of announcements uh, about what's going to be uh, a fairly uh, aggressive day of announcements from business in collaboration with government. So for example, 22 governments, including Australia and the European Commission, will actually announce the launch of four new missions today to catalyze investment and action to deliver clean energy technologies that apparently will be capable of facilitating urban transition to net zero emissions and eliminate emissions from industry and undertake carbon dioxide removal and produce renewable energy, uh, renewable fuels, chemicals and materials. Now, the one that Australia is involved in, along with Austria, called the Net Zero Industry Missions, won't actually be announced today. It will be announced next year. And one can't help but feel that might be announced around the time of an election. Call me a cynic. The next is that Think Tank Climate Action Tracker will publish tonight, 2 p.m., um, Glasgow time, its analysis of how much warming the world is heading for and accounting for uh, emissions cutting pledges that have been already made at the COP. And finally, as we indicated, the UK presidency has appointed 15 cabinet ministers from countries around the world to various negotiating files. What's instructive is that the group includes eight women and seven men, finally living up to the gender equality theme of today, the 9th. Now, finally, I'm not going to end in my usual way. I'm going to give you another thought for the day, which is beware of the slippery slope from cynicism to nihilism. It does lead to the same place as uh, denialism, which is inaction. 
Hope to see you tomorrow. We've got Lyndon Edgell back. Uh, Anna Lee is also hopefully going to join us, although she might be a bit busy, so we'll play it by ear. Emma Plant from uh, Moffat McDonald will also be joining us to talk about the industry day. And in a final farewell before he leaves and returns to Australia, Matthew Warnken will be um, regaling us with uh, what's been happening in his world over the last few uh, days. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you again to our speakers. Much appreciated for your contribution um, over the last, uh, uh, last half hour. And of course, to all of our speakers thus far, it's been quite rich and dense in conversation that I understand has been rippling through a number of different quarters. So we're, we're very grateful that you found this valuable. But for now, thank you very much. My name is Andrew Peterson and take care. Bye for now.